Blessed evening, church, brethren, pastors, co-primaries, and all guests this evening. Blessed evening to each and every one of us. Welcome once again to our Bible study night. And tonight we will be discussing the second part of First Peter. Because last week we already discussed the first part, which is last, last Wednesday. My name is Judith Alvarez. I'm one of the primary leaders of our dear Pastor Doc and um, Pastor Roche. And um, of course, before we continue or start with our Bible study night this evening, I would just like to ask each and every one of us to please bow our head and pray. Heavenly Father, we adore you, Lord. We glorify your name on high, O God. Thank you once again, O Lord, for this time that you have given me to open your word and discover who you are, O oh God. Thank you that you don't leave us in the dark about who you are and what you are doing in the world, but that you have revealed yourself and your will through the Bible, O oh God, your sacred words to us, O oh God. Lord, this evening, I ask with humility, O oh Father God, to cleanse our heart and our minds, O oh Father God, so that you will be able to penetrate easily, O oh Father God, into our hearts. Stir up our hearts, O oh God, and our mind, so that we will be receptive of your word, O oh God. Lord, we want to know you more, O oh God. We want to feel you more. So may I ask your Holy Spirit to infill us this evening, so that your word may will be preached to your people. Thank you, Heavenly Father, we give you back all the glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. So, um, last week, we have discussed or studied about 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. And it was entitled Sanctification. It was divided in two parts, which was the messenger or the revelation of the words to his people, and the second part was the response or responsibilities. Tonight, we will continue First Peter chapter 1, starting from verse 23 and extended to um, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And it is entitled, Regeneration. So let's open our Bible and read First Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And I am reading from ESV. And it says, Since you have been born again, not for perishable, but imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers, and the flowers falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So in verse 1, it says, 
of 2 Peter. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So every time a baby is born, you know that there is going to be a death someday. It may come soon or late. It may come quickly or slowly. It may come easily or in a very difficult way. But you know, as soon as a baby has set foot on the road of life, that they are walking to the grave. So why are the angels so excited when someone gets born again? Because that day, a life starts that need never die. So in the Bible, there is the power to give people life. Peter, in our Bible reading today, he had this power within his grasp to hand on to others. He talks about it in these in this few verses that we just read. He talks about life. You see, the thing that you need is not to be able to turn over a new leaf, but the thing that everybody needs is to discover a new life. Because all of us have ruined the old one. And that's why we need to discover our new life. Because we have ruined the old one. When a baby is born, you can see a sweet and innocent little baby. But once this boy or girl become a toddler, he or she becoming mischievous. It doesn't look too bad in the early years, but later he's beginning to look in the early um, years, but later he is beginning to look a bit more mischievous as he age. When the boy becomes six, he started to become selfish, angry, and disgruntled. That innocent baby grew up and he spoiled the life that God gave him. So did I, so did you. You spoiled it by learning to say no before you said yes. You spoiled it by learning to look after number one. You spoiled it by wanting to get everything you could. You spoiled it by losing your temper. You spoiled it because you learned fairly early that words can hurt. You spoiled it by learning that it was easy to be nasty or to be rude. That it gave you something of a thrill to say nasty things about other people. You learned to fight sometimes with your fist and sometimes with your tongue. And you or me spoiled it. God isn't interested in patching up anyone's life. He is not interested in just doing a spring clean on someone. What He really wants to do is give a brand new life to people. The greater the mess you have made of the life that you got at your birth, then the greater the wonder of the news that you can have a new life. So, Peter talks about being born again. That is not just an expression. It is a literal description of what happens when someone becomes a Christian. What actually happened at the time that Peter was describing about meeting Jesus was not just that got a relationship. He got a brand new life. I know that the habits of the old life tend to hang around a bit and cause embarrassment. But the proof that you have got a new life is that you now hate it when you do those silly and sinful things. 
There is a new life that has been born. Just as I began as a tiny cell within my mother's body or mother's womb. And at first, it may not have been obvious to anyone that I was on the way. Later, it would be. So, within every Christian, a new life has been born that may not be too obvious at first, but will increasingly be noticed by other people. They will say, whatever has happened to you, or whatever, what happened to you, it is this miracle of creation that is what we meant by getting converted. We don't mean joining a church. We don't mean going through a ritual rigmarole. We mean having a new life put within you, a life that is able to respond to God because by nature, you were dead to God. The life that you got when you were born was a little that centered on self, not on God. It was a life that was built around the nucleus of a capital I, capital I. It was not built around him, about around God, but the new life is. So let's go to deeper and look at our first main points this evening. And that as the contrast of everything. So first is the contrast. That means don't have to die. And this is in verse Peter chapter 1 verses 23 to 25. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of perishable, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. This is in verse 23. And in verse 24, again, it says, For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. And verse 25 says, But the word of the Lord has or remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you and me. So this is the contrast between the old life that you got when you were born and the new life that you got when you were born again is that the old life must die. The new life need not. So Peter describes what is true of everything, of every example of life in nature, that every example of life must die. Wonderful um, thought it is to take a little seed, the tiniest seed, the mustard seed you have. So have you seen a mustard seed? It's a very tiny little seed you almost need a magnifying glass to see it yet in those little specks in the hollow of your hand there is life it is an amazing thing and out of that tiny little speck can grow a shrub big enough for birds to come and make nest in it the marvel of life and seed yet the tragedy is that the life in that seed cannot last forever. The New Testament used two words for seed. Sometimes it is an animal word, which is they call it a sperm, or sometimes it is a vegetable word, call it a spore. One apostle says that when you were converted, God planted his sperm in you. Another apostle says that when you were converted, God planted his spore in you. They are just using picture language from nature to say that when you became a Christian, God put a tiny bit of life in you. That it has to grow. It is alive. It has to got to come out and it has to got to show if there is a lifetime or if there is a life in that seed or in that spore it has to grow into a christian character 
Whoever is born of God cannot go on committing sin. For the sperm of God abides in the Lord or abides in Him, says John. Peter says that you were born anew of imperishable seed. Only God, the Creator, can plant something in your life that will not die. Everything else, you plant it in your life and it will go. It has got to go, but not this. This is everlasting life. The flowers fade and die, says Peter. The grass goes. All of life in nature, wonderful thought it is, dies. One day, even the universe itself is to go. But the Word of God, plants never goes. Now, how does God plant His Word? Or plant His Word into this world, into each and every one of us? How do I receive this seed? How does it come into my life? That seed is planted in your heart when you hear the Word of God. That is why there's a preacher, there's a sower, Jesus said. The seed that is planted is the Word. Jesus said that. Not me or not anyone else, but Jesus. He told parables of farmers sowing seed, and He said the seed is the Word. It is the word that God says to you and the world is now enshrined in a book. But if it stays within the covers of the Bible, it is buried and cannot produce anything. It needs to be planted. The seed is no use until it is in the soil. This book is no use until it is in your heart or in our hearts. You can have a Bible at home and keep it on the shelf, but it will do nothing, whatever for you until the seed is planted. That either means that you must read it for yourself or you must listen to someone else read it to you. Or tell you about it but some way what God has said has got to be planted deep in your heart deep into our heart as soon as it is then it begins to germinate and grow the amazing thing to me is that people can resist this word it is true about them every time you read your Bible it is like looking in a mirror you can see yourself yet people can listen to a sermon and go home and think no more about it they have listened to the word of god hearing it and read it out and preach to them in person yet they can go away and forget it jesus talked about people like that He said they are like rock. They are hard soil or else they are shallow soil and they think about it for just a little while. But they don't think about it deeply enough and then it goes. Worst of all, a person sits in church and listens to the word and it gets into their heart. But Satan meets them as soon as they leave the church and says if you let that stay there your life is going to have to have to stop doing certain things what a deceitful words isn't it he is able to pluck it out of their heart before it can get rooted But now and again, someone listens to the Word of God. It goes in deep and they say, that's me. Who's told that preacher about me? (laughs) Sometimes we think that, oh, when they are preaching, I think he is talking about me. Someone talked 
about me to the preacher. How does God know that I'm like that? The word goes in and it settles and they can't forget it. It grows and the roots begin to get in and life begins. Not every Christian can say it was on a particular date that life began. That does not matter as long as it has begun. As long as life germinated and started to push up to the daylight. It is through the seed of the word, the good news preached or the good news about Jesus. So when you have become a Christian, you have been born anew. You have started a life all over again. Sometimes um, new Christians feel as little as a little child that you have got to learn all over again. Sometimes new Christians feel, oh, I shall never be a grown-up Christian. I'll never be a saint. I'll never be as good as these other people around me. They were once babies too, just like you and me. They had to learn to talk a new language. They had to learn to address a new father. So Peter, having described being born again, goes on to describe what is needed by a little baby. So I turn from being born again to the comparison between the two lives that you have, the physical and the spiritual, between being born again and born again. So the contrast is that your physical life has to die, but your spiritual life can live forever. Amen. So let's move on to second point. And it is the comparison. First was the contrast. Now let's see the comparison. And it's is actually of how to do have to develop. And this is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And let's read it again. It says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, that's the first Peter. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So the comparison in which they are alike is that your physical life and your spiritual life both need hair. I remember when I delivered my firstborn child, I don't know how to look after a such a fragile baby yet. And I received an advice from different people. But the very practical advice to us was keep one end full and the other end empty and you won't go far wrong. We came away with our little baby with these two simple rules. It is those two rules that Peter takes up in the first three verses of chapter 2. Someone who has been born again needs washing and feeding. They need to be kept clean and they need to be kept fed. It is as simple as that. What is that first thing that you do when a baby is born into the world? After they have cried their first cry and breathed their first breath, you wash them. You clean them up and you take away from them all the traces of their former existence. Isn't that the first thing to do? Well, I'm telling you, with a spiritual baby, it is the same. You will never grow up and be a healthy Christian unless you get washed clean of the dirt from your former existence before you were born again. I existed for nine months before I was born. 
in my mother's womb. I don't take my birthday back to the day of my conception, though some maybe culture do, but I take it back to the day I was born. Similarly, I take my Christian life back to the day I was born again. But I existed before that and I must be washed clean of the way which clings from my existence or my existence before. What is the kind of dirt that clings to a Christian of which a new baby Christian needs to be cleansed? Here are some things that can go on clinging and become a source of dangerous ill health to the Christian so that growth is thwarted and stunted. Number one is malice. The kind of life you live before you were Christian had malice in it. It is perverted joy in hurting someone else, giving as good as you get, taking your revenge. If someone did that to you, then you did it to them. If they don't speak to you, all right, you'll cut them dead. That's malice. It is part of the dirt that has got to be washed off if we are going to be healthy babies and grow up. No more malice. No more resentment to that person who did that. No more resentment to that awkward boss. Malice is gone and there is no desire to bring a person down a peg or two. The second thing that can cling to a newborn spiritual baby is um, guilt, being deceitful. According to the Bible, the heart is deceitful. You learn this with children so quickly. Even as children, we learn that you can cover up something wrong by telling a lie. That is something that has got to be washed away when you are a born again. You have got to be finished with deceiving people and trying to manipulate them. When Jesus met a man called Nathaniel, he said, Look, behind a rule, uh, behind a true Israelite, in whom he is no girl. What a compliment. A true Christian is to be someone of whom others can say. There is a true Christian who is no snake in the grass, someone in whom there is no girl, no underhand method, an open, honest, upright person. Thirdly is insensitivity. If there is one thing that has no place in the Christian life is, it is hypocrisy. One thing Jesus hated was play acting, people not being themselves, people putting on a veneer, hiding behind an exterior. Jesus wanted honesty. Even if that honesty revealed things that were not very nice, He would much rather have that openness and honesty. Insincerity is something that needs to be washed off a newborn spiritual baby. Fourthly is envy, which is a horrible thing. It was responsible for the first murder in history and the worst murder in history. Envy is that cancer that eats out a person who looks at another and says they have got more opportunities than i have they have got more money than i have they have got more gifts than i have they have got more friends than i have and begins to be full of self-pity envy is a horrible thing Alas, it works even among Christians. You can envy a fellow believer's experience, yet it is part of our former life. Fifthly and finally is 
is slander. I would rate gossip far, far higher in my priority of sins than almost anything else. Slander is the devil's own work. The philosopher Pascal said, if everyone knew what each had said of the other, there would not be four friends left in the world or in the world. You gossip before you were born again. Everybody talks about people, about someone else, not just the ladies, the men, to, uh, the men do too. Gossip is dreadful thing, but when you become a newborn babe in Christ, it is one of the things that has got to be washed away for health and for everything. Here then are five things which are not crude, obvious sins. They are all very subtle. It goes without saying that sins like murder, adultery, and stealing are to be left behind when you are born again. But we don't always realize that things like gossip, malice, and envy are to be washed away if you are going to grow up in your Christian life. So on the negative side, a new baby needs to be cleaned or cleansed. And on the positive side, it is, it is need to be fed to keep the other end full, as what earlier I've said, and to feed the baby with something that will help it to grow. You will never grow as a Christian unless you feed this life within you or within us. With what kind of food? You might be asking what kind of food that we should be feeding. Peter says, as newborn babies, long for milk. The word he uses in the Greek language is lunch for the milk. Have you ever watched a baby suckling at the mother's breast? A baby keen to get breakfast lunches, eager to get the milk? Peter is saying, as newborn spiritual babies, lunch at your nourishment want it more than anything else you need nourishment that has five characteristics and what are these five char characteristics number one it must be spiritual as your physical life is fed with physical food your spiritual life is fed with spiritual food it is food for the soul the one thing that is food for the soul is the very same thing that was the cause of the seed of life being implanted in your life, which is the Word of God. The spiritual food we need is to be found in the Bible. Nobody ever grew up to be a mature, healthy Christian who did not read and read and read the Bible. I know it's not an easy book you could start with luke's gospel and read that through then acts then the letter of james feed on it take it with you to work and read it and in a little gap after lunch but feed on it until you begin to grow second is you need to be it need to be digestible food some parts of the Bible are very meaty and you have to chew and chew, but some are milk. Psalm 23 is milk. You can read that straight away as a newborn babe and you can suck it in and nourish your soul on it. So be sensible in this. Don't try to eat what you are not ready for. Don't worry if certain things the preacher says seems to go right over your head there will come a day when you will understand all that is preached but don't worry as long as you have got something i don't expect people to remember everything i have said in this evening you have an amazing memory if you do i can't remember everything i have said myself 
But sometimes I am very surprised when someone quotes me and I can't remember saying that at all. I wonder whether they thought I said it or whether I really did it. If you are a listener, take one simple thought from a sermon of this evening, then it has been worth preaching. The funny thing is that you find one person takes one thought and another takes another and so on. So I pour out a lot of thoughts in one sermon and hope that those who are newborn babies will get a little milk at some point. Some will be able to chew the deeper bits and get the meat. But don't worry if you can eat it all at first. Long for the milk. The meat can come along later on. I tried to put a bit of gravy on it and make it a little attractive. But even so, there will come a time when you can get your teeth into it. Jeremiah says, I have eaten your word. I have digested it, taken it right in so the third one is the food you need is pure the milk must be sterilized alas the tragedy is that we live in a world in which people have taken the pure word of god and mix it with their own ideas and their own philosophies and cut bits out and put it in their own words in place that is happening all the time you mustn't mix your intake with man's ideas it must be the unadulterated um, word of god if somebody tells you something that you can't find in the bible don't eat it don't drink it and don't take it in fourth one is spiritual food must be nourishing milk contains all kinds of things on the farm, they used to enjoy what was called bisting pudding. I wonder if you know what that is. It is made from the third milking after a cow has calf. It is a special kind of milk and you can make it into a delicious custard. And it is awfully good for you because in the early milk of a cow, there are all sorts of extra nutrients which get a calf going and the milk provides antibodies. You need that nourishing kind of milk that has everything in it that will help you to be protected against the attacks, the invasion, the infection of evil, which is going to be all around you. And finally, it is appetizing. There is something wrong if a newborn Christian uh, baby finds the Word of God boring. If you start feeding on spiritual food, it is something that you find it appetizing. You taste the kindness of the Lord. What you taste is good and you want more. If you are a young Christian and are not finding the food appetizing, then you must be on the wrong kind of food. Um, you must have failed to taste the kindness of the Lord. For as you feed on the word of God, you begin to say, Isn't the Lord kind? Isn't he good to me? The Lord is kind to a little baby, helping and protecting. We have been thinking about only six verses. What a little gem this passage is. Peter is talking about being born again into a new life. Then he goes on to say what the new life needs. It needs washing, clean, and it needs nourishing. If you don't go on from that new birth to be washed and to be fed, then don't blame God if your Christianity doesn't taste good. Don't blame Him 
if you don't grow up as others grow up. So my last word in this passage is, and which is also the conclusion, is that have you, or I ended up with a question, have you been born again? You could have the outside of a Christian, but not have the inside. You could go to church, you could behave like other Christians, but in the last analysis, unless you have been born again, you are going to die forever. So I ask you, have you read, have you received the word of God about Jesus into your heart? Do you believe it to be true that Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth to die in your place, to pay for your sins and rose again, that His Holy Spirit might live in your life and make it anew? Do you believe that? Have you taken it in? Then, if so, you have been born again. The new life has begun. But if you haven't, then I pray that God will help you for no one else can. Hallelujah. So if you are one of them, you or who have not yet born again in spirit and in truth, or you have been born again but did not fully grasp or understand the meaning of the born again, please utter this prayer and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I declare that I am a sinner, but I come before you with humility, with a humble heart, asking for forgiveness and repent all of my sins. Father, help me to cleanse my heart and my mind, O oh God, so that I will be able, Lord, to be written into the book of life. Thank you, Lord, that you have given your Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem me, O oh God. I want to be reunited to the Father through your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, today I pray that you have removed the filth and the dirt and cleansed me and washed away all the sins that I have done and make me new as a newborn baby. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So that's it for this evening. I pray that we have learned something this evening in the story of First Peter. And I pray that this will be the beginning of our life to Jesus, the red generation, the born-again Christian. For those of you who have prayed that prayer or uttered that prayer, Welcome into the life of Christ because you are now a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for our leaders once again for allowing me to speak before you for this opportunity. And I pray that we all be united together, loving one another, continue to pursue the goal the maturity that God wants us to be as a newborn baby. Thank you very much. And should I say bye for now and God bless everyone.